All right. I uh, think we'll uh, start up. Uh, just to make sure. Can everybody hear me? Audio working? Hello. Ah, good. Okay. So, uh, today's lecture is going to be on uh, types of Joseki. Actually, it's morphed a little bit from uh, when I was first uh, thinking about it. Once I had gathered all the materials that I had gotten for the lecture, um, I was originally going to talk about uh, the uh, different uh, general categories of Joseki, and I think I'm going to save that for a, a later lecture because there's uh, some more things I want to read through before I uh, go in depth on that topic. Uh, this lecture is going to be a related topic of uh, choosing Joseki. Um, you know, once uh, once you reach into the uh, I, I the, once you get into the single digit queues, uh, the further you get into them, you know, most players are usually familiar with a Joseki or two at least in most of the common situations that uh, you'll you'll come across in a given corner, and, and that's a good first step. But uh, to get stronger from there, you need to start being able to figure out what is the best Joseki. And uh, that, that all starts off with the first move. You know, should I pincer him? Should I just respond along the side? Can I tanuki? Um, figuring out what it is in a given local situation that uh, will allow the global situation to turn out best for you is a critical skill in uh, just about any Go game. So we're going to go through a bunch of openings, fairly early in the openings, when a critical Joseki question uh, will appear for us. And we're going to look at what are the different kinds of moves, uh, what, is, what are the uh, different reasonings for each of the moves that uh, players usually have, and then which moves are uh, the best ones. Uh, it's also important to note, you know, there's not always one right answer. Uh, sometimes there's a, a few different Joseki you could try. Sometimes there are moves that are just plain wrong. But uh, oftentimes you may have more than one right answer. So with that in mind, let's get started. Uh, first is just a fairly simple opening. Everybody takes a corner, black approaches, white ignores, we have a pincer, and we're going to go across a Joseki that I think most of you are pretty familiar with. This is uh, one of the many Joseki that uh, can occur for black, and, and we could discuss later maybe uh, why he didn't choose a different one, but um, this sequence is very well known. And uh, from here, actually, we have some choices as white for what we want to do. And this is where our problem is really going to start. So first off, what are the choices that white has here to continue? Anyone want to uh, take a stab? What, what are white's moves from here? We have P3. And S7. Yes, perfect. So we have both of these as possibilities. But uh, then the next step is, well, we, we could obviously play either one. But uh, which one should we play here? <laughs> yes. A, okay. A seems to be the uh, universal choice. Why, uh, why A? Why not B? What's uh, what's the issue with B? True, it does keep sente. Yes, R17 is low. All very valid reasons. What's uh, important about keeping sente here, though? I'm sure we get influence. But... Uh, Yes, coming back to the bottom, the E3 stone is one of the most important points to uh, consider. So yeah, this is a pretty straightforward one. Yeah, P3 is going to be the better move here. And then the general sequence goes like this. And now white has sente, a very, very important sente, to uh, launch a pincer attack against E3. And so white's fairly happy with himself. Not only that, but because of R17's low position, white should be able to reduce the upper right without as many problems. Um, for those of you that don't know it, the other Joseki that uh, you can generally do, uh, assuming that uh, ladders are good for you, of course, bad things can happen if uh, black can do uh, all sorts of interesting ladders here. 
So assuming that uh, you have your ladders, you can play like that. You, you, assuming that uh, you have your ladders, uh, assuming white has his ladders, what's black's move here? Any idea? What's uh, how does black respond? Assuming since our, the ladder's not good, <laughs> resign. Always, a, always a good test of G. Yes. Yeah. P three. P three is our move. Now, naturally, this uh, these, this threatens white stones. So, what should uh, white do about it? How is white to resist this move? Any ideas? Should white Atari sacrifice? How does white get out of this? Mm. O five might have problems. <laughs> Uh, yes, O4 is uh, the way to do it. Yes, O4 works very well here. And then Black's next move is forced. Any idea what uh, Black's next move is? There's only one move. You you really can't play any others. Yes, S2 is the only move. If you play anything else besides S2, your corner is going to die. So black really has no choice in the matter. Now white also really has no choice. White takes R8 to make his uh, three stones there much, much, much stronger. When does white Atari? Ah, that's an interesting endgame question. Um, Usually you don't want to do it right now. Um, you can save it as a co-threat. So there's no real reason to uh, do it right now. But uh, later on, it could become a good endgame sequence. Yeah, no no reason to do it right now. Just save it as a co-thread. It's a great sensei move. It's not like black can ignore it. And then here, depending on the situation, uh, sometimes black will play at A, and sometimes black will chop through at B. And that basically finishes it off. And, you know, this is, of course, a local Joseki for white, but... Uh, I guess my issue here is, you know, first off, white is building. Well, let me ask you guys, why, why, even though this is locally a Joseki, why, uh, why is this maybe less than ideal compared to our uh, other variant for white? Any ideas? Why would white prefer the other variant to this? Yeah, so uh, the, the key to look at is what's going on on the upper right and the lower left. Sente is also nice, but uh, Black actually doesn't have Sente. He needs to finish off this sequence. The basic way is like this. And this is a pretty straightforward sequence. So White builds himself some pretty good thickness. But uh, the problem here is Black has uh, R17, which is a very low stone and a very strong stone. Um, so it's pretty hard for white to develop anything or attack anything on uh, the right side. Uh, furthermore, black has built himself a very strong group on the bottom, making e3 pretty difficult to uh, attack. If black manages to get uh, d5 later, he can uh, potentially build a very, very large moyo there. So this is uh, less than great for white in this particular circumstance. However, there are many circumstances when you can play like this as white. So the first one was fairly straightforward. Uh, the second one might be a little bit trickier. So we have a uh, San Ren say for black. White encloses the corner. And black approaches at uh, D4, uh, D5. So this, of course, this high approach is very, very popular, as I'm sure you're all aware. And there's a large number of responses. Um, who would like to uh, try and note just, I don't know, the top uh, top four or five most popular responses for white? Just to put them down on the board. What, what are the, the four or five things that, uh, locally at least, white generally likes to do? Yeah, we got C5, we have C7, we have, well, there's already a stone on D5. Uh, we have, let's see what else. F4, D8. Yeah, these this is a this is a good place to start. 
Uh, these four are a good place to start, I think. Also, let, let's look at e5, because uh, this is also valuable. So we have a large number of choices for um, white to possibly play here. So first off, what uh, before we ask what the right move is here, what move do you guys think? Just off, uh, what what move what move do you think might be bad here? W which one of these five is probably going to lead us to a uh, less than superior result? But what should we not do as white? So we should not play A, not play B. Anyone else want to take a shot? Everyone's so quiet. Not play C. A, B, and C have all been uh, smacked down. All right, let's uh, let's uh, take a look at each of them. So this is uh, one of the most common moves that uh, White will play in many situations. But uh, you, you guys are you, you whoever said A is correct. This is probably not the best move that uh, you want to play here. Um, the issue is, what is Black's reply? And this is important. What is Black's reply here? Yes. It is very important you play d4 here and not c6. Everybody almost always plays c6 by instinct, it seems. But c6 is not always the best move. If we just play out a basic sequence, so black has built himself something on the left, but the left is already low potential. Remember, white already has a low strong corner here. So the, the left isn't that valuable for black to try and develop on. But uh, if we look at the bottom, what about the bottom? This bottom is uh, bottom's very important. Black has a high uh, strong stone at d4, and he would love to further expand his moyo that he's built with uh, q10. If we compare... we can get something along these lines. And uh, I, I could do a whole lecture about all of the insane things that uh, you can do with Avalanche from, yes, this can, well, no, this can get into the Avalanche. It's, uh, you can avoid it, yes. If you uh, don't like the Avalanche, you can avoid it. So the large Avalanche, which is the more common one played today, is black goes here, white, uh, white goes there, black goes there, white hanes, black cuts, White descends, black goes here, and from here, uh, it spirals off into a huge, huge number of variations. Yeah, a, a, a lot of uh, very, very fascinating variants can happen here. And I, I could probably do a whole hour and a half lecture uh, just talking about all the, the, the fun variants you can get into off of the large avalanche. Suffice it to say, lots of very complicated fights. But you can avoid those fights without too much of a penalty. Um, if white goes at uh, c6 and you want to avoid a fight, it's not difficult. You can Atari there. And then either you can A, defend the cutting point here, or B, you can play uh, more fast and play something along the lines of uh, k4. Yeah, something like this. You, you can also consider playing like this. And this is a very fast way for black to play, and black is uh, perfectly happy playing this way. There's, there's nothing wrong with this. You, you don't have to play out the large avalanche or, or fear getting a disgusting result. Can white avoid it too? Um, once uh, white plays this move, white is pretty committed. If black insists right here, Usually it's not possible for white to get out of it without getting a fair result unless he goes for the avalanche. So if white does not want to do uh, the large avalanche, he should not be playing c6. Um, white has a number of choices here, actually. He could go for the small avalanche, which is much simpler and much more clear-cut. Uh, the same type of thing will occur. And you can actually get... A really interesting exchange of thickness. There are more variants, of course, but uh, this is just uh, one of the the old-fashioned simpler variants. It might seem strange that uh, Black Tanuki's this cut, but the key about this cut is it allows uh, the ladder to be broken, and you will get something along these lines. 
basically a massive exchange of thickness for both sides. This is probably much better for white in this case, however. The bottom is much more valuable than uh, the left side. Well, yeah, th this isn't that good for black, though, because the left side isn't that valuable for him. But once again, there's always more variants that uh, black could choose. So, uh, you know, it's not just uh, C3. But I, I, I digress. We could, we could uh, continue discussing Avalanche for uh, many, many hours. Um, the, the general idea is that uh, playing like this will allow you to develop the bottom. And that's very valuable for you. Oh, someone asked earlier, I think, about high-low here. And when you should play a C10 versus D10. Um, that's not an easy question to answer. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of factors that can go into choosing. C10 is, uh, of course, simpler for territory. Uh, D10 can, uh, of course, naturally get influenced a little bit better. Um, in this particular case, I don't know how much of a fan I am of D10 because it seems like uh, white has a very, very easy response at uh, C12. And that gives white a, a two-space extension and threatens to rip out black space. And I'm... Black black can build some center point. Black can use his thickness here. So this is probably still playable for black. So yeah, you, you could probably play high here because black is clearly playing for influence. So yeah, I, I, I'm not going to tell you one is definitively better than the other here. Um, you would have to ask someone stronger than me. <laughs> to me, they're both very playable. But uh, let's go back here. So we've already looked at A and uh, found that uh, A is maybe uh, not that great. Um, let's see, what about, uh, what about B? What do you guys think? Uh, good move, bad move, so-so move, what's, uh, what, what's the, the, the analysis? It could get into what we looked at earlier. Yes, that's uh, that's one possible variant. <laughs> mm. So this is usually a wrong move for white when he already has the... Uh, low stone at uh, c15 usually this is not the right move for white um white can end up pretty flat depending on how black plays and uh, there's a huge number of variations here that uh, we could go through but the general idea is that uh, c7 uh, c7 is is if black wants to it can be pushed pretty low and if black does that then uh it's not going to be an ideal Ideal result for black. This won't. This won't. Uh, an ideal result for white. This won't necessarily end terribly for white, but uh, c7 just feels a bit awkward. Um, that's not to say that a pincer isn't a good idea, though. Doing a uh, two-space pincer, especially a high one, is probably a much better idea for white. This uh, has a good low high to low high relationship with the uh, c15 stone and. Uh, it can uh, start some fights that uh, white can manage. You could settle for a, a, an approach up top. You can attack d5, uh, help ensure that d3 isn't uh, going to be uh, attacked too hard. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a fine move to consider. Um, also, you can also actually consider this move here. Uh, this is a norm, you know, in modern Go, this is oftentimes considered. Uh, too soft of a move for white. But uh, in this case, it's actually fine for him. The idea is that if we just play at a normal variation, once again, the left isn't that valuable for black. White already has a low strong stone at C15, whereas in comparison, the bottom is very valuable for black. Black has this D4 stone that he wants to develop from. And white has gotten himself a very strong group after f4, and white has sente to develop from. Uh, the top is still probably bigger, but why e2 instead of b2? Ah, 
That's an interesting question. So, um, yeah, I, w I won't tell you that B2 is inherently wrong here. Usually, you, you could do B2. And it's a pretty similar result. The issue I have with it in this particular case is if white doesn't play a, if white doesn't play again on the bottom side, you know, white really wants a stone around 017 because that's a great approach for white. Uh, but if white does that, giving black a move at uh, H3 is very very annoying. Um, this is just very frustrating for white. His base is getting attacked. Uh, if white doesn't respond, you know, bad things can happen. And if white just responds uh, passively, if you will, uh, black has basically gotten himself a, a free move without uh, too much harm. So when you already have something on the bottom or when h3 isn't a great move for white, then uh, b2 is uh, probably a better idea. Oh, if you e2, I would uh, probably say the top is more valuable. Yeah, huge fan of uh, the top here. Uh, O3 is also very, very large, but uh, you have a, a great possibility for uh, building something on the top as well. Still, it's fairly close. Um, oh, let's look at uh, E. What do you guys think of uh, E5? Is this uh, okay here? What do you think? Okay? Is it terrible? Is it okay? Is it meh? If white can get sente, oh, that's a great question. Can white get sente out of it? Ah, strange. So it's not the most common move. That's true. However, it does still see professional play. And uh, so it's important to uh, know the variations on it, at least the basic ones. So yeah, that's one variation that can happen. Um, the uh, more common variation is black will play here, and white will come back, black will defend, and then white usually has two choices. White can either claim the corner with c5, or continue building out thickness with uh, f6. In this particular case, f6 seems fine. And the general result you can expect is something along these lines. It's basically a trade of massive thickness. Um, and there's other variations that can occur. If white is scared here that black will try and counterattack with uh, h6, uh, sometimes white can either uh, just uh, Atari here or extend. But uh, g8 is usually more common. Um, and both sides trade uh, pretty nice thickness here. But uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, who's, uh, whose thickness is more valuable? You know, who, whose power is more valuable here? Why is white's more valuable? Yes, it's a bigger area, but uh, yeah, so the, the two stones we want to focus on to see who this is better for, we have Q4 and C15. Ah, that's true. Black does have Sente, and he can take K4, but K4 isn't Sente, remember. If K4 was Sente, then you might have an argument that, uh, no, 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 not at all. It's not a ladder. It's a, it's a net. Yeah, very important net to know. Yeah, if black could get K4 in Sente, then you might have an argument that this is too good for him. But because K4 is Gote, uh, white has no qualms. White is very alive, and white can uh, basically Tanuki. White can just say, okay, and you know start playing along here. And remember, white has some really powerful thickness here. So later on... You know, invasion at A or maybe B. Invasions at A or B become much easier to manage because white just has this extremely powerful thickness facing that side of the board. So this is uh, perfectly playable for white. You know, I'm not going to say the game is lost for black, of course, but uh, white has no qualms doing this. 
So those are the basic ones there. Is the close pincer modern Joseki still a thing? Which uh, modern Joseki are we talking about here? Are we talking about C3 then? Ah, uh, this one? Hmm? Oh, 10 at G3. Oh, okay, for white. I was wondering what you're talking about. Yes, 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 these. Um, yeah, these are still played. Absolutely. So for those of you that don't know these, the general idea is for black to go here <laughs> and white to go here. And then the important point is uh, choosing which uh, for black to play next. What uh, what should black do here? Mm, almost, not quite b4. Yes, b5 is one choice, absolutely. Yeah, b5 is uh, one way of doing it. And then black will defend, and then white will defend. Or, of course, uh, white can go in here, and black can launch an attack on uh, c7 also uh, played sometimes but yeah that's the general idea the thing that uh, black cannot do though is play c2 immediately because this will happen and this is very annoying for black but is it still better for white in this particular board situation um should be fine for black I don't think either side is uh, really crying that much after these after this result. If we just play it out fairly normally, black has uh, made the corner pretty safe. White has gotten to ruin the bottom. However, black gets a very 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 important sente for uh, k17. So yeah, uh, there, there's a uh, it seems fairly equal. Black has no qualms. I'd probably call black actually a little bit better here. All right, let's uh, go on to the next one. We spent a while on that one. Ah, this is, uh, let me see, this is a good one. So this is an opening with a bunch of corner approaches and tanukis, which uh, make the choice of the next move uh, sometimes pretty complicated. So black has uh, pincered white stone. And the first question is, what should... Uh, First off, what are the uh, the common responses for white? Just uh, you know, three or four most common. We don't need to list uh, every single response out there, of course. Yes, N4, of course, the uh, exceedingly common response that you will uh, very, very often see is N4. Well, what else exists? We have P3. We have N5. Hmm... We don't usually have p6 in this situation, however. p6 is usually uh, left for the uh, low one space approach. Oh, and some people are suggesting uh, r3. Yes, and o4 is also sometimes to be considered. Uh, well, o4 is not that common these days. Um, we, we, we can talk about o4 if we have uh, some time afterwards. But uh, I think these four are good to look at. So first things first. This is not Joseki. Uh, don't play this move. It's just bad. It looks like it should be Joseki. But the problem is here, white doesn't really have a good follow-up. Q8 is uh, perfectly placed to, uh, uh, for lack of a better phrase, screw white over. Um, there, there's just no great way for white to continue. I mean, white won't die, of course, but he can't really do anything that effective with his stones. I mean, for example, if uh, white moves out like this, black could just do this, and uh, you know, black won't have that many issues, making uh, his bottom group fairly safe. And uh, it's really hard to attack Q8 because uh, you know, O5 isn't settled yet. 
if White tries to immediately pincer, all Black needs to do is play just very, very simple go, and Black's going to end up just fine. White is very, very sad here. White has two weak groups, and Black is building points on the bottom while making K3 stronger. So this is very unpleasant for White. Uh, Moral, do not play R3 against the two-space high pincer. It is, I would go so far as to say, almost never a good idea. But uh, one move that uh, nobody uh, said is, or maybe someone did and I missed it, is uh, 5 O5 is a very simple move and a very effective move in some situations for white. But uh, let's uh, look at the others before we go into O5. So this move, what is uh, the point of this move? What, what, why, why is you know this move is so common on uh, KGS? What, why is it played? What does it do? Not magic sword. Ah, that's the idea. Yes. The idea is that uh, you're offering Black the ability to cut you. And Black oftentimes will take you up on that offer. And when he does, you will treat N4 lightly and settle yourself in the corner. And while there's a number of uh, subtle variations we could look at, the uh, just absolute basic straightforward variation that uh, you've all probably seen before is this one. But uh, if we look at the end result of this, um, black is pretty happy. You know, e3 is looking kind of nice. In fact, if black wants, he could even consider trying to make a moyo out of this. And then just attempting to uh, build himself a moyo on the uh, bottom side. This is uh, all black stones are working pretty well together to uh, build himself something that he wants. So this is pretty nice for black. So because of e3's placement, it's probably not a good idea for white to play uh, n4 here. Um, ah. So I'll, I'll go over uh, the, the one space jump. This is a good idea for white to play. Um, absolutely. This is very playable here. The uh, idea, of course, is you want to separate black, you want to keep your shape very, very strong, and you want to prepare to uh, pincer against uh, Q8. And that's uh, perfectly playable for white. It's a aggressive idea, but uh, yeah, it's uh, certainly playable. There's uh, no qualms against it. But uh, black actually has some choices of, its, of his own here. Um, most players will almost automatically, as black, play O3 here. Yes, you stole the words from my mouth. N3. So this is a small difference, but a very important difference. Uh, w w how do we decide between, uh, in our Joseki, between N3 and O3? H how do we choose? Is, are they just almost the same? Is there no difference between them? Is there some sort of reasoning that we use? Why choose one over the other? <laughs> a good question. <laughs> well, I hope so. Uh, no uh, immediate answers. It's not an easy question, actually. Even though it looks pretty simple, the, the moves are actually somewhat different from one another. A invites a cut. Mmm... All those are uh, th those are all partial answers, and they all they all uh, speak to a part of it. Um, yes, a move does give uh, uh, more forcing moves. Uh, I, I think the, the key around all of these points is you, you are trading uh, speed for solidness. A, of course, is a faster move. It uh, gets black or attempts to get black more territory faster. Uh, the downside of that, of course, is that uh, white could can potentially get himself more forcing moves off of that stone. Um, 
With B, white gets much fewer forcing moves, but it also attempts to claim much less and has uh, less powerful uh, follow-ups that uh, you can play. Yes, O3 also could be considered a uh, better defense for the corner. Absolutely. Um, so if we play uh, A enables R3, um, not immediately. You Well, you could play it immediately, but um, in this particular case, still not a fan of doing it immediately. And we'll see why in a moment. Um, but let's play out this variation first. And without doing anything crazy, what is uh, the, the usual next move that uh, white will do here? Just, you know, standard, uh, nothing, nothing insane. Yeah, he'll usually attach once, and then, but yeah, M5, and then M5. This is the classic idea that uh, white will do. And normally, black will need to respond at uh, M3. If he doesn't respond at M3, he won't die, of course, but it doesn't take much imagination to see that uh, this is a very unpleasant move for black to deal with. Um, black's corner will live, but it's not going to live very happily. And yeah, E3 is very, very sad. It's very, very saddened by this move. So almost always, if the board is fairly open, black will uh, follow up at M3. And then white will have the opportunity to do something along these lines. And we could argue about whether or not Q11 is the perfect placement. But uh, generally, to come into the right side and start attacking uh, Q8. And this is uh, probably a little bit too good for white. The issue here isn't locally what's happening, it's E3. E3 is, very, E3 is low, and all the other stones, M3, O3, and Q3, are also low. Black's entire bottom side is full of low stones. And that's just uh, not that great for black. You know, black can't play, or can't effectively play uh, D5 to try and build a wall. Um, <laughs> yeah, black is all, uh, black has very low, uh, his, his life, but it's all very low. It's not inspiring at all. It's nothing special. But uh, let's look at uh, the other variation. So this move moves us uh, one move faster. And, you know, sometimes white will attempt to play here. And this is, I, I guess, what we would call almost a, a purposefully provocative move. You know, 99% of the time when this happens, black is going to cut. And this is not a pleasant fight that white wants to deal with here. Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh... <laughs> Ah, how do I know? Um, it depends how your groups are doing all around. So, uh, if you can get away with this as white, you have to look after the safety of this stone and this group. Yeah, they're usually brute force is called brute force for a reason. Um, it depends on uh, how A and B are doing. Um, because of E3... I don't think M4, or white's A stone, is uh, doing that well here. Um, it's not going to be that pleasant for white. You know, if we just play out a few more moves, just assuming that uh, they do something rather simple, if black attempts to uh, start leaning on uh, C4, hmm? L4, yeah, yeah, K4, yes, we can do K4. K4 is probably more common. I, I was doing this to uh, make a point on the bottom. But yes, if you want to be technical, K4 is the better move. <laughs> and then black has some choices. Um, black can continue to resist. And then white will usually descend. And you can get something along these lines. And many fights will start. So it's a very fighty move. But I'm not a huge fan of it for white here. But yes, uh, K4 was correct for white. But much more commonly, you should see this move. And, uh, you know, before, as black, we had to play M3. But uh, what can we do as black now to uh, develop our bottom? What can we play in this case? 
Yes, we can play L4. And this L4 is working much, much better with uh, E3. Now, it's true that white might get some forcing moves, but, uh, you know, the right side and the center are still very open, and white doesn't yet have a base. So the fight on the, the, fight on the right, even if he gets a pincer against Q8, is still uh, up in the air. But this move does a lot to help uh, black's E3 stone. Much more than uh, black only having uh, M3. Now, I, I should caution that there's Aji in uh, black's connection. The uh, biggest weakness in black's shape goes uh, like this. And there's a large number of variations that uh, can happen from here, depending on what's going on in the board. Um, yeah, there, there's a, a huge number of things about what can happen. Um, if black just attempts to do this move, white's going to uh, give it to him and play like this. And in some situations, getting a panuki there is okay. But in this, in most cases, this probably is unpleasant for black. Yeah, that, this is probably unpleasant for black in most cases. Um, if black wants to set up a really big fight, or I should say a really big ko, he can uh, play like this. And this sets up something uh, extremely large. Uh, but he probably can't fight the Ko this early. So if White attempts to do this right now, White's just going to ignore basically almost anything, that, just about anything that Black does to win this Ko. But this could become a huge, huge Ko fight. Um, another possibility is uh, Black plays up like this. This can start uh, many, many, many variations. Uh, from white attempting to capture O2 to white uh, attempt to cut through, white connecting. Um, yeah, many, many, many possible cuts and fights can go on from here. Um, it's playable for black, but it is a weakness to be aware of when you play faster like this. You know, this is the downside to not playing so solidly at O3 is that white has the ability to make complications here. But regardless, we're giving E3 a lot of help and we're also moving out faster. So it's a, it's, a, it's a playable variation and really a cost-benefit analysis. All right, let's go on to the next one. Where is that variation? Ah, this one. Oh, in the last one? Yeah, yeah, one space jump was uh, what he should be doing. One space jump is fine. Yeah, sorry if I didn't answer that clearly. Okay, so we have ourselves with a similar situation. Black has just very early in the opening done a two-space pincer. I'm sure many of us have been in probably this exact situation before. And uh, we have that question of, gee, what do I do as white? <laughs> what do I do as white? Yes, everyone wants to play Magic Sword. <laughs> Magic Sword is a little wild. Ah, uh, Magic Sword could be its own fun lecture. Without going into too much insane detail, the general idea of Magic Sword is like this. And from here, many, 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 many things can happen. Um, it's a very complicated fight for both sides. If uh, one of the players doesn't know what they're doing, in terms of the variations that can follow, it can uh, collapse for one side or the other and cause many big many bad things to happen. <laughs> but yeah, this is uh, the, the start of Magic Sword. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, going back to uh, White's possibilities. Locally, assuming we're not going to Tanuki as White, what uh, locally can uh, White consider? Any ideas? What, what's okay here? So let's see, we have uh, N4. Ah, 
we have uh, n5. Yeah, and uh, we, we have the same starting moves as before, but uh, N3, mm, N3 isn't really a Joseki move. Um, there might be some situations when you can do it, but uh, it's not really a common move at all. I, I would call it a very special purpose move in very uh, particular situations. Is P6 any good? Um, no. Don't do p6 here. Uh, p6 is usually only a good move against the one space low pincer. If you do it here, all white needs, all black needs to do, is just play very normal and very regular, and we get this result. But instead of blackstone being at a, blackstone is at q8, and so now we're left with this question: is you know, what do we do as white? And the answer is there There really isn't any move that's that great for white here. It's very hard to pincer because white isn't alive yet. And uh, yeah, there's there's just not that much useful. <laughs> flip the board is a great test of G. Absolutely, I, I agree. Yeah, you can flip the board as white here. Yes. Yeah, R3, we already discussed R3. Also, probably not a good idea, usually for white. So let's see what happens with uh, this move. We play out our normal variation. We are uh, expected to get something along these lines. Um, <laughs> unlike before, this is probably playable. This is uh, pretty playable for white. Uh, Black has built himself something uh, fairly decent on the bottom. And you can argue about k3, you, you can consider playing it slightly differently, but uh, k3 is just one variant. Um, yeah, black has built himself something on the bottom, white has built himself a very secure corner, and you can also look into either attacking q8 in the near future, or just tanukiing, you know, and maybe take uh, d10, or something like that as white. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'd been the R2 Joseki. Do you guys want to uh, take a glance at R2? Yes, yes, this is very, very old-fashioned nowadays. I know. There are many, many newer ones, and we can get into all the uh, interesting new things. But a lot of those are just uh, subtle moves here and there that uh, change the... They, they change the results slightly, I guess, for one side or the other, but the general idea of them is still fairly similar to the very old-fashioned move. Oh, what is the uh, question? But yeah, uh, S4 is considered very old-fashioned these days. If black K3 after R2... How does white respond to the cut at Q6? Um... Yes, you play R6 now as white. That is an excellent answer. There is a very, very interesting little quasi-net that occurs, which uh, <laughs> which is very fun to look into. But no, the, the, <clears throat> the general idea is white can just play, play like this. And this may look slow, but uh, this is actually a very powerful move here. First off, it ensures that the corner is iron solid. Um, it weakens... Uh, Q8 substantially, and it, uh, make sure that uh, 6 isn't going to be cut off, isn't going to be cut off uh, anytime soon. Actually, uh, the Tessiji you have to worry about. If I am remembering things properly, this is uh, the Tessiji that you have to be very careful about. I, I guess it's, it's not really a trick, but it's a mean move. If white doesn't know his variations carefully, black can do terrible things to him with this. So if white just plays somewhere else, black will go for the cut. And for those of you who are at uh, more of an advanced level, I'm sure this is all very familiar to most of you. 
All very well and good. But uh, the key is what happens here. And Black has uh, cruel things he can do here. Namely, Black has N8. Now, how does White normally escape this move? What What, what is White's uh, standard tesogy to uh, escape from this capture? Yes, N7 is the standard move. <laughs> this is uh, the, the classic way to escape. And if Black goes here, of course, White will just go here and make himself safe. But because of k4, this happens. And white gets stuck in a little net. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, if your opponent, if you do descend at r2, yes, if you do descend at r2 and your opponent responds at k4 specifically, you absolutely have to play r6 or something to defend your stones over here because that's a terrible, terrible cut if you don't. But yeah, S4, of course, is a very old-fashioned move. But it still it gets the general point across without having to uh, go another 45 minutes into all the fun variations of R2. <laughs> okay. What about, uh, what about the type of situation we did before? So let's say white goes here first, and now we have the same choice. One space or two space? What do you guys think? Should we one space or two space? We have a one space, we have a two space. Why? What arguments? Why one versus two? Why? Biggest question is always, why? Anyone want to give any reasoning? Ah, all right. Uh, good points to look at. So, in this particular case, black is going to want O3 here. Um, this is a little bit better for black. That's not to say that N3 is a terrible idea. But uh, O3 is probably a bit better for him because now Black has no qualms about doing this because he doesn't have any stone at F3 that would make it all very low. So he's not making himself uh, have very low bad shape. Um, well, the, the, the key here, I think, is that first, yeah, it doesn't have that much potential for Black. But also it does have, or I should say it had, a lot of potential for White. Uh, D4 is a, a stone the white would love to develop from. And, of course, by just playing nice and simple and low and solid, we are stopping him from easily developing. Now, if uh, white tries the same idea with the pincer here, white certainly can consider this, but this is a little different than uh, just having the star point. When you have an enclosed corner like this, it makes it harder for white to do this because white's uh, R14 later on it's not really an approach. It, it has no uh, uh, sente oomph behind it. You know, if black just had a, uh, a star point stone, this would be an approach that black would want to respond to in some way. But if white does this move here, you know, black just shrugs and continues either running with Q8 or Tanuki and play somewhere else. <laughs> I hate when that happens. So yeah, one space jump probably uh, not as ideal here. Uh, all right, let's go over uh, one more. One more that I like before uh, we head out. Is the mic close to my mouth? Oh, are you getting uh, feedback? Is it too close? Too far? <laughs> oh, okay. You can hear my breath. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is this better? Too soft? Better? Yes, breath? Ah, okay. Yeah, just, uh, just, oh, all right. Well, you should have told me that earlier. Crap, now I have a lecture full of my breath. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I should just uh, name this video, you know, uh, Songs of Josh's Breathing. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. It's very minty. Oh, yes. So let's go into, uh, before we head out, the uh, we've been doing the high approach all night. I want to talk about the far approach. Uh, this is also probably a move that uh, you may or may not have uh, played before. Um, so first off, what's the point of the high approach? Why would we uh, ever consider doing it rather than a closer approach? What's, uh, what's, what's our, our, our emphasis? Yes, of course. Harder to pincer. He wants to avoid a severe pincer. It's easier to make something live uh, by attaching in the corner. Uh, it makes it, uh, it simplifies things for white. But if it has all those benefits, if it's pincer resistant and it simplifies things, but uh, what, uh, what, what's the disadvantage to F17? Any idea what's a disadvantage? Yeah, it's a bit slower, not as much pressure. You can't really, you know, press down on black like you can with uh, the closer move. Um, and it allows black, if he wants, to just take a, a, a corner very simply uh, without too much, uh, too many problems. So what are, uh, just to name, let's say, what are the, the three most common responses for uh, black here? We can, of course, name countless. But for the sake of brevity, the three most common. We have d17. Anyone else? Any other uh, moves that he can play? Yeah, we have h17, certainly. And what's our third option? e17 is an interesting one. Um, e17 is rarely played these days. But it does exist sometimes. Yes, and e16, but not on this board. Very good. Um, oh, and I guess you can also consider J16, which is actually different than H17, and it's important to know the differences between uh, H17 and J16. Although J16 is a bit rarer, it's uh, still played on occasion. So, what do you guys think about this move? Is this okay for black here? Acceptable, bad, good... We have a yes, a yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit slow, but it, it's very simple. And, you know, the, the key judgment that you should use, yes, yes, it's, it's a very good move. The, the key judgment you should use to determine whether or not this move is good enough is how good is L17 for us? Because black really wants to play this move as the follow-up. And, you know, is this move good for us here? Is it uh, effective? Yeah, it's it's pretty effective here. N no issues with it. Black is very happy to take uh, L17. So because L17 is good, this you should have absolutely no qualms about uh, doing this as black. And then just to show the very simple continuation, although there are others, a simple follow-up goes something along these lines. You can consider changing uh, D13's placement somewhat. But this is the general idea. And then white will play like this. And it looks like white has spent a lot of stones. And it's true he has. But remember, white's group is very solid now. And white just went into black's side. So while this is a, you know, black has gotten space on both sides, on the flip side, white is very, very strong and very, very solid. And, you know, in the future, there's not really any way that black is going to be able to attack this group. So this is basically a fortress of stones that white can use to attempt to reduce and shrink and, you know, uh, attempt to project power from uh, later on in the game. So that's perfectly possible for him. Uh, as uh, was already discussed, this is probably not a great move for black here. Um, this is a great move for developing the left side, for building a wall and allowing white to live very easily on the top side. The issue here is black doesn't have a stone around C10 or D10. Uh, had black already had that stone, you could certainly consider this. This is, of course, uh, Kobayashi's opening, one of the uh, very common situations. So, for example, if somehow uh, this had occurred, or th if this was the board, now this is uh, the classic move, and a very, very common move for black to play here. And this has been uh, highly studied 
There are many, many, many variations that can occur. But uh, the general idea being uh, black plays e16. <laughs> black played twice in a row. Yes, black has cheated and now resigns from his cheating. Excellent. But the, the general idea is that black wants the left side. So that's probably not that great here because we don't have anything on the left side. Uh, pincer, pincer is playable here. The general idea with the pincer, as I'm sure many of you have seen before, the common variant is this. And then black can choose between either uh, f16 and f14. Um, in this particular situation, you're probably all right with f14, but uh, not always. It does leave some very annoying Aji that you may end up dealing with later on from uh, f17. So you do have to be careful of that. Depends on the situation, though. But yeah, that's, of course, fine for black, being able to uh, build the top side. Oh, yeah, and there's a lot of co-threats in there. Uh, just to quickly, the, the key thing to go to worry about as uh, black is uh, white can usually attempt to do something along these lines. And white needs help in the center, of course. If black attempts to do this directly, white's going to attempt to kill the corner. You know, white's just going to do this and basically kill the corner uh, against black. So a big trade of uh, influence for territory. That isn't always good for white, of course, but uh, it's uh, it's a matter of what else is going on on the board. The, the point is it's something for black to worry about for the rest of the game, which is why many times you'll see players just go here because that Aji can get really, really annoying. So this is also played. But uh, let's go look at the, the difference between the low one space and the high two space. This is uh, less common, but uh, is still done. And there's a number of things that could happen. But let's assume for a moment that white plays the same way for us. And what is different about this variation for us. So the first thing is that uh, black usually doesn't play e14 here. Uh, black will oftentimes play a little bit differently mainly because uh, j16's placement becomes a little bit more awkward. First of all, black is forced to play here. There's not even the option to play uh, f14. So that that's uh, that's one thing that can be annoying. But also, j16, uh, I don't know, it feels a little awkward to me that it's just sitting there because f17 may still have something in it. If black gets, if white gets the cut here later, there's uh, there can be frustrating Aji in there. If white, if black starts to run, so that's not a terrible result, but it's a little awkward. Uh, well, f f seventeen isn't necessarily efficient, but it kills off the Aji from f seven h seventeen isn't necessarily efficient either, but it kills off uh, f 17s Aji a lot better. So j sixteen isn't that efficient in that case. Oh yeah, j sixteen neither kills off all the Aji nor is that efficient. So what black will usually do here is he'll actually play d13. The idea is to provoke white, to split him. And then black gets to go here. And now black doesn't have to worry about uh, that cutting point at all, because he doesn't have the cutting point. His stone is in a totally different place. White will continue to move out, and black can move out flexibly. Yes, you've induced white. And white will usually finish up right here. This is this is a classic variation. Um, so white has gotten himself more in the corner here than he did in the previous variation. But uh, we have a pretty important difference. What's our uh, what's our big difference here? White's gotten himself more in the corner, but uh, what difference do we have as black? Anyone want to take a shot? Yes, we have Sente now as black. We give, uh, yeah, we've also played on both sides. We give white a bigger corner, but uh, in exchange, we uh, can potentially play elsewhere. Well, it's an exchange. 
And of course, there's other variations for white to play besides, you know, just plainly taking the corner. But let's compare this against a slightly different opening and to look at uh, what changes and what we need to look at. Here we are. So, uh, same type of situation, just uh, right out of the gate. White plays uh, far approach. And then black... Uh, whoops. Oh, no, wrong one. Wait. One of these. Here we go. So, assuming that they have a variation played in... Uh, the upper right like so. White is white now does the uh, F17 stone to cut off M16 naturally. So how is black to respond to uh, this kind of thing? What's, uh, what's black supposed to do? Defend the corner, try to pincer, jump out. Uh, what's, uh, what's a good looking Joseki in this kind of picture? Some argument between the fiercer pincer and the looser pincer. Everyone seems to be in agreement on the pincer. So yes, that is uh, correct. You do not want to play this move here because you're just going to provoke white to play here. And this is much too efficient for white. White is thrilled to be able to get this. So, you know, we, we cannot possibly allow that to happen. So really what, what it is is a question of pincers and which pincer is going to be the most effective. <laughs> N17 is tempting. Well, that's, that's the key follow-up that uh, we have to be aware of is which move is going to let us do that easiest. If we do the tight pincer and we have a, you know, just the standard variation, we can expect something along these lines to occur. But we have to end in gote. And if we end ourselves in gote, white gets this move. Which is pretty annoying. This is kind of perfect for white. It uh, ensures that white lives without a problem. And it rips into black space. If we compare that against the other variation, whether you're doing uh, J17, J16. If we do the same thing now. But now we go here, that critical difference is showing itself off to us. Because we've forced white to uh, spend more moves, black now has the ability to play that N17 move that you wanted to play so much, which is uh, you know the, the ideal move for uh, attack and defense. Yeah, this makes uh, white very, very sad. So taking Sente here, was a critically important idea. So basically, when you want Sente, play a little bit further away so you can play the uh, D13 variation. If uh, you just want to minimize White's corner and you know just make yourself as solid as possible, play the uh, closer H17 pincer. Um, yeah, uh, my throat is getting a little bit sore, so I think I will uh, call that all for the night. But uh, thank you all very much for coming to watch. I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and hopefully I'll be able to start doing them uh, more frequently now. So uh, thanks everyone for watching, and I will uh, see you all next time.